Okay. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today, I would like to, do, to talk to you about how uh, you can make construction bricks using microorganisms. This is very simple biotechnology. It's, it doesn't involve any molecular aspects yet because it's just an emerging field. Um, there are very few, or um, as to my knowledge, there's only one startup company that is doing this. Okay. So I'm Jessica Simbahan, and I come from the Microbial Ecology of Terrestrial and Aquatic Systems Laboratory of uh, the Institute of Biology in New Zealand. So biominerals are everywhere. They are ubiquitous in nature. And you can find them in anthills, in caves, underground caves, especially in corals in the shells of mollusks, and even in our teeth and bones. So the process of biomineralization produces biominerals um, from living organisms. And those that, are, those that can, can accomplish this are, micro, um, are algae, bacteria, proteins, plants, and animals. Okay. So in the Philippines, you can find, sorry, you can find many of these structures in Karamoan and in Palawan. And would you believe that many, some scientists believe that biomineralization um, is the cause of these plant formations. So these formations were made by bacteria. In fact, a group um, theorized that two kilometers of um, limestone can formation can be, uh, can be produced by bacteria in a million years. So this is the process that we are trying to do in um, producing bacterial grapes. So concrete is the most used concrete material in the world but its production is unsustainable because of the high environmental impact. Now, to produce concrete, you need water, aggregate, and cement. And it is the production of cement that causes high carbon dioxide emissions, about 10% of global carbon dioxide emissions. <coughs> okay. So the actual biomineralization process that we are trying to harness in production of bricks is called microbially induced calcite precipitation. And it's the deposition of calcium carbonate or calcite by bacterial action. And it is a naturally occurring process. In fact, in coral reefs, and um, that's the most common um, process, MICP. So this is an example of a colony with the crystals formed inside the colony. Okay, so how does MICP occur? If you look inside the limestone formation, you can see the sand particles, and in between there are, there are the bacterial cells. The bacterial cells act as nucleation sites, and there are exopolymeric substances that surround the bacterial cell. These substances are negatively charged, so they will attract the positively charged calcium ions. Now the bacteria, on the other hand, uh, contains or produces urease, and the urease will convert urea into carbonic acid and ammonia. Now, if the ammonia will cause the pH to rise and the carbonic acid then dissociates into your carbonate ions, which bind to your calcium ions and you get crystallization of your calcium carbonate at high pH. So it is these crystals that will bind your sand particles together. Okay, so first we try to isolate and screen for calcifying bacteria. 
our source was around the UP campus, and we were able to get 18 isolates that produced crystals when we grew the isolates on media with um, urea. Okay, so we also got uh, um, samples or isolates from the Philippine National Culture Collection. So out of these um, 18 positive isolates, we tested for urease um, activity, and we were able to get eight isolates, those that turned pink, as our um, potential um, bacteria. So next, we conducted quantitative tests, um, calcite precipitation test, the urease activity test, biofilm formation test, and exopolymeric substance binding assay. So these are the properties that we want um, from our uh, potential isolate. So for our calcite precipitation test, we measured calcite deposition when we added calcium chloride to solution. And we found that isolate SS4 and UA6 um, precipitate the highest amount of calcite. We then conducted the urease test and um, we determined the change in color of the medium when uh, during urease activity the medium will turn pink due to the production of the alkaline um, alkaline substance. Okay, ammonia. So we have UA6, SS4, and SS2 as our potential isolates here. And then we did our EPS assay. And our best as best were BS1, which is an isolate for us, uh, from TNCM, and UA4 and UA4 and MC1. Finally, we did our biofilm formation test, and our best isolates were SG3 and MC1. Oh, no, no significant differences were observed. So from these results, we were able to identify our best isolates. They come from uh, the genus Lincini bacillus, um, the most common bacterial species used for biomineralization are spores are Cyanacasturi, Bacillus megatherium, and Bacillus subtilis. So the literature you will find are on these three genus uh, species. However, Lincina bacillus is, has not yet been used for, product, for the study of um, bacterial formation. So we then selected three isolates based on the characteristics that we tested and these we optimized for bacterial grid formation. So in this figure we show the three isolates and their optical density and their calcite production based on the amount of urea in the medium. Um, and we selected the best um, concentration of media. And then we now dis um, design the process of making the brick. So you need four ingredients. First, you have your fat sand in whatever mold you want. And then you need sterile water, the bacterial medium containing the culture of bacteria and urea. And then your sanitation medium containing your nutrient broth and calcium chloride. Our initial um, um, method was to produce our bricks in columns. We used syringes with three inches of packed sand. We passed our bacterial culture and our sanitation medium through our columns and we were able to get just very short knobs. Um, this entailed many trials of how, which 
solution to pass first? How the how long does the solution have to stay um, with the sand, etc., etc. So, but then for our um, little stub, when we look at the the stubs under the microscope, you can see. So we, we saw that these were the sand particles and they were indeed um, embedded in the bacterial calcite. <coughs> so next we prepared another mold and then we combined strategies that we read from different literature as well as from our own experience in making the bricks and we used, sorry, we used um, the isolate SS4 and UA4, and we also included BS1, mixture of BS1 and SS4. This is because BS1 um, produces high exopolysaccharide, and we thought that it would provide more nucleation sites for the crystals. Okay? And then we, after we produced the bricks, we tested for compressive strength. And we found that um, SS4 alone, when we made the brick, com was comparable a little um, to 15% cement. Because this is the compressive strength of 5% cement, 15%, and 25% cement. Now in construction, you use 25% cement. Um, for our <coughs> experiments, we were able to um, get about near 15% and we know we can even increase, we can still increase the compressive strength of our bricks um, just by the strategy of how to um, embed the sand in the crystals. Um, yeah. So, for the production of uh, sustainable bricks, these are the different um, parameters that should be satisfied. And I think for our procedure, we were able to do so. It must be a natural biological process. So, this biocement was produced by bacteria. It must have a low energy input. So, our treatment just used percolation. Um, it must have a low carbon footprint, so the process can be achieved at room temperature, no heating needed. And then we have to use locally available materials, and the materials can be easily produced. Now, other applications of MICP are for bioremediation, such as the removal of heavy metals and radionuclides from the environment, uh, for high carbon dioxide sequestration, because as you can see, it uses CO2. Um, and then um, <coughs> microbial enhanced oil recovery and limestone and concrete restoration. So our future plans include um, concrete restoration. This is an example of um, what you call self-healing concrete. And the strategy here is that if you produce your concrete, you embed your microorganisms in pellets and you embed it in the concrete so that when a crack occurs, the crack will sear your, um, where the microorganism is embedded and then the water that comes into the crack will release the nutrients in your pellet so that the pellet now becomes liquid, it's available for the microorganism, and the microorganism is a spore former, that, that's why it can uh, survive um, for a long time. So when the nutrients and the spores germinate, then the microorganisms are able to grow, and thus, if you have a crack like this, after 28 days, the cracks have now been filled. Okay, so those are future plans. There is one uh, startup company that is, they, I read, a very, I saw a video of uh, 
a long time ago of this company. And they said they plan to commercially release their bricks in 2017, and I don't know if they have. But it's, uh, it was founded by Ginger Craig Doshier and her husband. She's an architect, and um, yeah, they're already producing prototypes of um, concrete bricks. Okay, so I'd like to acknowledge um, the faculty of IB for helping out, and also um, engineer Rapino of the construction materials and structures.